So what I want to do next is walk you guys through a few things that I've been learning this summer that I'm really excited to share with you guys. And I think they all fit together really well. And they give us, and they show why we, as not just Republicans, as not just conservatives, but as Bible-believing Christian conservatives, have a message to share with the rest of the movement. So I want to talk to you guys about three things. The eyes, the game, and the big question. The eyes, the game, and the big question. And you'll see this little bullet points on the back of the program. But first of all, the eyes. So where you look is where your body will end up going, right? If I look over at Vicky and try to walk over towards the posters, how well is it going to work? I mean, maybe I get there, but I'd probably end up making this little zigzag, right? Because I'm looking over at Vicky, that's where my body's naturally going to want to go. If you're driving a car, and you look at the front of the semi as you're passing it, what happens by the time you get to the front of the semi? You're practically touching it. So, because I'm in charge of the program tonight, we get to start by talking about dirt bikes. <laughs> On a dirt bike, this problem is even worse. <clears throat> So, for example, on the road, you can see your motorcycles. You look at the back of the bumper, and this is a freeze frame. But if you watch the rest of the video, the guy hits the back of the car. There's plenty of road, but he was fixated on that back tail end. Where it gets really bad for dirt bikes, for me especially, is when you're coming into a corner. So if you're coming into a corner, imagine you're on a motorcycle, and your brain tells you, I'm coming in too hot, we're going in too fast. The very first thing your brain does, within less than a second, is it estimates where it believes you're going to go off the road. Based on my speed, based on et cetera, based on the gravel, I'm probably going to go off on that spot in the corner. So then what your brain automatically does is it stares at that point because you want to try to avoid it. What happens is, if you're staring at that point in the corner, yeah, you guys are laughing because you've probably done it. <laughs> if you're staring at that point in the corner, guess what's probably going to happen? All you can end up doing is you realize, I'm not going to make it, so you just start slamming on the brakes and you eventually stop at that point on the corner. Or you just, you know, blow through it and go off the corner. And so a buddy of mine showed me a while back this video it's called target fixation. <coughs> That's what your brain naturally does. If you force yourself to look past the corner through where you're trying to go, it's going to feel really, really weird, but you'll do a lot better. It's like, okay, that's interesting. So the next time we went out riding, we had our intercoms on, we were talking, we are going through corners. It helps a lot. But here's the deal. It's really, really, really hard. There were some times I would to verbally yell at myself, through my helmet, not to look at the corner, but to look through it. And you have to constantly force yourself to look at the road ahead. Once you do look at the road ahead, your brain only focuses on two things. You're noticing if your tires are getting traction and whether or not you can add throttle. And that's when you can go through the corner. So, my question. Is the Republican conservative movement suffering from target fixation? Have we come into a corner, seen the threat, and forgot to take our eyes away from it? For example, when we did the SWOT analysis, you can see here, of the 30 people, we, they could give multiple answers to each question. We had 51 total strengths given for the church right now. 61 total opportunities mentioned. 66 threats, 83 weaknesses. I had two people tell me when I asked about the strengths of the church, they said, I don't see any. Is the conservative Republican movement potentially suffering from target fixation? And we need to look through to where we're actually trying to go. Now, I think we, this movement here, the Christian conservatives, do a better job. So does that mean we have a message to bring to the greater movement? Yes. Now here's the deal, if this analogy is accurate, it's going to be really, really, really hard to look away from the corner. And I'm not saying ignore it, the reason we're having this discussion is because the corner exists. But it's going to be really, really hard to look through the corner and look on. So that's what I mean by the eyes. Before we move on, as you all know, millennials are great at putting filters on things, right? We're great at posting the highlights on Facebook and never telling you any of the lowlights, right? So before we move on, I have to be honest. The reason this picture looks so cool is because it's actually a freeze frame and this is what the rest of the video looks like. <laughs> no, I wasn't target fixated, I was just throttle happy. <laughs> so sometimes we'll slide out even when we're not target fixated, but it'll happen a lot less often if we look through the corner and not at the corner. So that's the eyes, we'll move on to the game. 
One thing I've been learning about this summer is called game theory, and there's two types. There's infinite games and there's finite games. A finite game is defined as known players, known rules, known time frame. An infinite game is known and unknown players, the rules can change, and the time frame is continual. With a finite game, the point is to finish the game as the winner. With an infinite game, the point is to remain in the game, to continue the game going. For example, baseball is a finite game. You get to the end, and one of the players is like, you know what, if we could just play two more innings, I think we could beat them. Their own teammates would look at them like they're nuts, right? Because everyone has agreed this is the end, they're the winner. An election is a finite game. At the end of the night, whoever's got more votes is the winner. Infinite games would be things like business. Now they talk about being the best and winning, etc. But what are they trying to do? Perpetuate the game and stay in the game. You don't lose an infinite game, you just eventually lose the will of resources and you have to drop out. The point of an infinite game is just to stay in the game and succeed while doing it. <coughs> Marriage and friendship are the same way. My parents have been married 35 years. Can you say they've won marriage? No, you can't, because Kip and Lynn are probably married longer, right? No, because you can't say you've won marriage. The point is to continue in the game and to be successful at it. Now, you can have rivals that are doing better than you, or that you're doing better than your rivals, but the point is to stick in the game. What are we playing? An infinite game or a finite game in American politics? <laughs> We're playing an infinite game ultimately. We're playing smaller finite games like an election, but we have the perspective of the infinite game. At the end, on November 3rd, that night, do we really care who gets to be called the winner? No, we don't care who gets to be called the winner. We care about what the next four years look like because we're trying to perpetuate our country and keep succeeding, right? So we play finite games and we work really hard at them like an election because we see the real picture. So when I first saw this, I was like, that's really cool. And about 10 minutes later, I was like, but why does it matter? Well, the more I learn about it, the more I see that the strategy choices are different. And here's what I mean by that. If we are playing in a finite game, like let's say the election, is meeting later this week for coffee with your liberal friend because he said, you know what, I just cannot understand how you can vote for Trump. I literally don't even get it. Like, let's sit down to coffee, tell me what you're thinking, because I don't even get how you could do that. <laughs> If we're playing a finite game, is that a good strategic use of your time? The election is, what, a little over a month away? You're not going to convince him. Is that a good use of your time? <coughs> probably not. If the strategic goal is to win the finite game, it's probably not. If we're playing an infinite game, is that a good use of your time? <coughs> Absolutely. So is America a finite or infinite thing? Well, we say, Benjamin Franklin told us, you have the republic, madam, if you can complete it. And we call it the American system. You guys gonna let me get away with that? No. If you can keep it. If I can keep it. Yeah. Within minutes of figuring what this thing is gonna be, we were told it's an infinite game. This is what you've got if you can perpetuate the game. When you look at the world stage, is America gonna continue in the game or are we gonna drop out? So in the back of your program, there's number two, it says the infinite game. Um, there's about an hour and a half video of the presentation, it's only about 15 minutes, where he goes through what does it really mean to be in a finite game or an infinite game and the strategy choices that you'll make. And I think it'll really apply to us. <coughs> so I just wanted to add that there so you can continue. Um, we're always learning, right? So before we move on to the next one, this is probably the ultimate explanation of finite versus infinite. <coughs> Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to the children in the bloodstream that must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. But one day, we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like when the United States were men were free. We're playing an infinite game. So if we know where we're supposed to be focused, we're supposed to look through the corner and continue on to victory. We know we're playing the infinite game you probably have an idea of what the big question is, right? The top threat mentioned was what? Socialism and Marxism. 
we're worried about you know the older generations that are so convinced of socialism and Marxism, right? Yeah, I don't think so. And we're worried about not passing it on what? In the blood? We don't pass it on in the bloodstream, right? So what's the big question? Teach your children well. Teach your children well. Teach your children well. The phrase I usually hear for the big question is how do we get young people involved? We can't. Young people's not a thing. What does involved even mean? Young people, there's no such thing as young people. There's only your niece, your grandson, your daughter, the kids in your church youth group. Honestly, I get a little bit frustrated because I've been asked this question so many times and it's so vague and people just want a vague answer that will get tons of young people suddenly committed about Christ and committed to politics. Is that how things like that work? Do kids today need to be taught to love America? Yeah. There's a 30 minute, super easy way to teach them how to love America. You know, just like your marriage is, it's 30 minutes and you have the whole thing figured out, right? Okay. <laughs> no, so you can't just necessarily get young people involved. We have to be more specific. When I asked, I was talking with Chris Monk at the Catholic conference a while back. Brilliant attorney. I mean, whenever I have a question, he's one of the first people I talk to. Legal mind, great perspective, great at details. He, said he knows more words than I'll ever hope to know. We were talking, and I said, what do you think the solution is? America's polarized, it's getting really crazy. What do you think the solution is? And he looks at me, he goes, genuine human friendship. I was not expecting that out of an attorney. And I thought about it, I'm like, that makes sense. A little while later, I was meeting with a lady named Beth. Beth and I agree on some things. We're both committed to our faith, but on a few political things, we're, we don't agree. But we definitely have a passion to sit down with each other, sharpen each other, and you know, discuss things. But again, on several political issues, we definitely don't agree. She asked me that same question. She was like, what do we do about the polarization? And I looked at her and I go, I think it's genuine human friendship. She just goes, yes, <laughs> thank you. So can you just reach young people? No, we have to build genuine human connection. And if we go back to the Gen Z luncheons a while back, you remember there were generations where, like in my grandma's house, nobody called, you just stopped by for coffee, right? You didn't, you just stopped by, spent time with each other. And then it got to the point where you had to call before you came. And then eventually went to you just called them instead. And then you have to now you have to text them before you call them. <laughs> or um, we could just test them. And as the younger and younger generations, the amount of connection goes lower. And as most of you know, if we zoom in on that little point, it actually gets worse. There's just texting and you've got Snapchat where the things disappear and then social media posts where you just look at what each other did and that's about it. Or you can comment on it or maybe just click like. And that's about the level of connection that they have right now. So if the older generations are much better at connection, and the younger generations are anxious and lonely and looking for a real connection, does that start to give us our answer? And finally, I want to talk to you guys about a book that I was reading for a class this year. So Douglas Hyde served in the Communist Party for 20 years, writing for their paper, training the kids, you name it, this guy did it, 20 years. Then one day he just left. And shortly after, announced that he was converting to Catholicism, he had become a Christian. So after a lot of examination, he said, okay, the communists are very effective. The Christians that I'm seeing aren't as effective. I'm going to write down why in the Communist Party we were so effective. And maybe give some pointers to the Christians. So I want to read just a few sections out of this book. Youth is a period of idealism. The communists attract young people by appealing directly to that idealism. Too often, others have failed to either appeal to it, or appeal to it, or use it, and they are the losers as a consequence. We have no cause to complain. If having neglected the idealism of youth, we see others come along, take it, use it, and harness it to their cause, and against our own. 
It is fashionable in some circles to sneer at starry-eyed idealism. All of the ways of helping communism I can think of, none are better than this. Communism becomes the dominant thing in the life of the communists. It is something to which he gives himself completely. Sound like something else we know? But we should be doing? It is ludicrous to suppose that a half-hearted Christian can conduct a fruitful dialogue with a fully dedicated communist. So when talking about what, why kids were recruited to communism, again, this is 1966. Discuss their case histories with them. Probe into what first attracted them to communism and invariably you will find that it was not communist theories, policies, or campaigns. Important as these may be in making of communists, but the impact made upon them by some dedicated communist, which predisposed and conditioned them to associate with the movement and to accept a doctrine which would otherwise most probably have been unacceptable to them. With a bunch of fancy words, what did he just say? Somebody built a friendship with them yeah. and just walked right in. And then they totally accepted hook, line, and sinker beliefs that maybe otherwise they wouldn't. And he goes on in the book to make some contrasts between what the Christians ask for and what the communists ask for. He said he would talk to Christians and say, you know what? All my pastor ever really did was ask me to stack chairs once in a while. And here the communists have this amazing, this amazing world-changing goal. Who actually has the world-changing plan? And who asks less? So I wrote this on the back of the programs. Dedication and Leadership, Douglas Hyde, 1966. Um, you can get it on Amazon, $20 new, or six, six or eight dollars uh, for a used one. But those are a few things that I've been learning, and I think they all have the same thing. We have a message to bring to the greater movement. We in this room understand the three things I just said, I think better than most Republicans. So we have a message to bring, and we can be leaders to others who are maybe frustrated about what's going on. They see the craziness going on, what do we do? Well, now you have the tools. We've always been better at these kind of things than the general frustrated public category. So all of us have just a few more pointers now, and it's up we probably already had anyways, to become leaders to the general movement. So those are a few things that I wanted to share. 